Hi everyone, welcome to a new section in this unit. So we've been talking about atomic structure and we've looked at protons, neutrons, and electrons. And now we're going to focus this week on electrons and electron behavior and also the layout of the periodic table. So it really goes in well with what we covered last week in this class. So the first question that I have for you is I would like for you to answer this question. I love to go to Disneyland. I love to go to Disneyland and watch the fireworks. I love to go on the rides, but really, honestly, the firework displays at Disneyland are unbeatable. So I would like for you to answer this question. What causes the different colors in a fireworks display? So this is our first engage, our first, this is our phenomenon. What do you think causes the different colors in a fireworks display? Now that you've answered that question, we're going to go ahead and look at a couple of things to maybe help you answer that question. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the fact that light has a duality. Light has properties of both waves and particles. So waves, think about it in terms of like even waves at the beach. So waves at the beach, you're transferring energy in those waves. And then particles, how do particles behave? So like if you threw a ball, what would that look like? So we're going to take a look at a quick video that describes these two things. See particle-like behavior every day. Drop a ball on the ground and it follows a single trajectory. Leave your giraffe parked on the street and when you come back, it's still there. Just one giraffe. And we see wave behavior too. Toot your horn and waves spread out through the air, carrying sound to the ears of anyone around. Or drive a boat through water and waves travel outwards along the surface. But when it comes to the physics of the very small, what we see is a wave-particle duality. Sometimes very small things, we're talking electrons and protons here, behave like particles. And sometimes they behave like waves, flip-floppers. For example, if you release an electron, it'll travel outward as a wave through the room, but when it hits the wall, it'll only hit in one place. You started with one electron, after all. So what if sound had a wave-particle duality? When you shouted, the sound waves would spread outwards in all directions, but only one person could hear what you said. Or when you drove your boat through the water, the waves would travel like normal, but only hit the shore in one place. Now that would make for some pretty boring surfing. Spend some time looking at waves and the properties of waves. You might have covered waves in elementary school or in junior high school, but right now we're just going to glance over waves just a little bit and just talk about the properties of waves. So waves are going to transfer energy, but they're not going to actually transfer any matter. So when there is a disturbance in a certain medium, that's when you can end up transferring that wave. Longitudinal waves like sound, they need a medium. So sound is going to travel fastest through a solid and it's not going to travel in a vacuum at all. But longitudinal waves, the disturbance is going to be parallel. So think about it this way. As I'm talking to you, the sound waves are hitting going forward, okay? So the energy is transferring at the same exact location as the matter is the matter is colliding with the other matter, okay? Now transverse waves, transverse waves are a little different and light is a transverse wave. Transverse waves, they actually have these disturbances that go up and down, okay? And then the energy transfers side to side. So they're actually perpendicular to each other. Think about it like if you were to take a slinky. I don't know if you have a slinky around the house, but if you do have a slinky around the house and you attach it to something and you wave it up and down, up and down, that would be a transverse wave. Whereas if you took that same slinky and you pulled it back and compressed it and then let it go, that would be an example of a longitudinal wave. So longitudinal waves go parallel and transverse waves, your disturbance is up and down and your energy transfer is side to side. So light trans travels like a transverse wave. The disturbance is perpendicular to the transfer of the energy. Light can travel in a vacuum. It does not need matter to be able to travel, whereas sound does. So if we take a look at the parts of a wave, okay, it's really important for you to see what these parts of a wave are. So when we look at the wave, the wavelength, the wavelength is going to end up being uh, this part right here where you see that top line and that top line is going to end up showing you um, your wavelength. 
So your wavelength is right here, okay? And the wavelength is the distance between one peak or crest of a wave and the next corresponding peak. So a wavelength could be from this point to this point. A wavelength could also be from this point until the wave starts to repeat itself again. So I can go down and then up and then back down. And once I hit that equilibrium point, that's going to be a wavelength. Okay, and so you're seeing in this diagram that going from zero to two, that's my wavelength. So the wavelength here is a two meter wave. Now the amplitude, the amplitude is high, how high or how low. So the maximum or the minimum, how much the distance is from the equilibrium point, how high the disturbance went. Okay, so that would be like right here. Okay. And so that would be like, how loud is your music? And then your frequency, your frequency is going to be how, how many waves can you get? So for example, we have a wavelength right here, but if I wanted a higher frequency, a higher frequency wave is going to look like this. And a lower frequency wave is going to have a longer wavelength. So wavelength and frequency are actually inversely proportional. As wavelength goes up, frequency goes down. As frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. You'll see right here, and this isn't a super straight wave, but you'll see right here, this is our wavelength right here. That's not a very long wavelength at all, okay? So these are the different parts of a wave, and that zero point where your disturbance starts, that's called your equilibrium point. So now, what does this have to do with electrons? Well, electrons can end up being dis disturbed and they can absorb energy and they can release energy in the form of light. So what we have to do is we have to look at the electromagnetic spectrum. So all light is the electromagnetic spectrum and we have visible light, like that's what we can see. So you know visible light spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay. But then there's also gamma rays, radio waves, long waves, short waves. You also have um, microwaves. So you have all of these different types of waves on your electromagnetic spectrum. But all electromagnetic waves will end up having the speed of 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, So that's something that's really important for you to point out right there is that the speed is always 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's constant. It does not change, okay? All electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light, okay? And the speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency. So you can see that in this equation right here where this upside down, so this is your speed of light is 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Your little upside down Y looking thing, that's your wavelength. And then your frequency, sometimes people in physics will use frequency as an F, but in chemistry, we actually use frequency is kind of like a V looking, looking thing. It's a Greek symbol. Okay. But that's going to end up being our equation. So speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. And you need to be able to manipulate that. So what if I wanted to find the wavelength at a certain frequency? Well, I want to get wavelength by itself. How do you get wavelength by itself there? You want to get rid of frequency. So you're going to divide by frequency. So if I divide both sides by frequency, I'm going to end up getting wavelength equals C divided by frequency. Okay, And then frequency equals C divided by wavelength. Now, your visible light spectrum. Your visible light spectrum is what we can see, okay? Um, white light is going to split into your red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And you learned that song when you were a kid, when you learned all of the songs, the colors of the rainbow, right? So red has a smaller frequency and a higher wavelength. Now, that is something that we use in physics a lot when we're talking about, or even in earth science, when you're talking about the expansion of the universe, the philosophy is that the evidence that the universe is expanding is if you looked at the edge of the universe, you see a shift towards red. And when things are going away from you, it's called the Doppler effect. Things go 
to a lower frequency, okay? As things come towards you, you have a higher frequency and things go away from you, you have lower frequency. And you experience this Doppler effect when you're in your car, when you're driving down the road and the ambulance passes you. You can sense it coming closer and going farther because the frequency of that sound is changing. So again, what does this have to do with light? Well, we have this evidence that the universe is expanding because we know that as things are getting farther away, they shift towards a lower frequency. And because we see at the edge of the universe seems to be a red color, because that red color is there and we know that red has a smaller frequency, that's that evidence right there. So this right here is your electromagnetic spectrum. So it's important for you to see like where gamma rays are and where your um, where your gamma rays are and where your radio waves are. Your visible light spectrum is right here. I mean, that's that's where your visible light spectrum is. This is the part of the spectrum that we see. Okay, and then on the side of a violet, we have UV or ultraviolet rays. Okay. And over here, we end up having infrared rays. Infrared is on the side of red. So again, we said that red has a shorter, or I'm sorry, it's a shorter frequency. And so if you look at it, you end up having these longer wavelengths at red, and violet has shorter wavelengths. Okay, and you can look at that in this picture. This is a good picture for you to be able to look at and, and um, observe. Okay, so then how are we going to use this? Well, in this class, we're going to use these in our calculations. Now let's talk a little bit about what all of these different things are. So you see this HZ. HZ is your frequency. So your frequency is measured in what's called Hertz. Okay, and the reason that it's called Hertz is because you're when you're looking at that, your hertz is one divided by seconds because it's how often a wave passes per second. So frequency is per second. So one over second is equal to one hertz, okay? So in this question, how would we even solve this problem? It says, what is the wavelength of radiation? So we're looking for wavelength here of radiation with a frequency of 1.5 times 10 to the 13 hertz. So in this case, you write down what your given is. Your given is C, we know what our C is, our C is 3.0 times 10 to the eight meters per second. And our frequency is our 1.5 times 10 to the 13 hertz. Now to solve for a wavelength, we just talked about this, you do your speed of light, divided by your frequency, okay? Notice I've used my F here because it's easier for you to imagine frequency as being F. So in chemistry books, you're going to end up seeing that V symbol, but really they're the same exact thing. I just think it's easier for you guys to use the F for frequency. And also if you go on and take physics next year, then you also know that terminology a little bit. So the next question is, what is the frequency? So I like to box sometimes or highlight what my question is. I'm looking for my frequency. What frequency is the radiation with a wavelength of 5.00 times 10 to the six centimeters? So I'm gonna actually have to convert that to, and it's actually 10 to the negative six centimeters. So I'm going to actually have to convert that to meters. So you move the decimal over two. So it's actually times 10 to the eight meters. This is going to be my wavelength. Okay. And then this is going to be my speed of light. So my frequency is equal to my speed of light divided by my wavelength. Okay. Now, why do you think that you would end up having to convert to meters? My hint to you is look at the units here and look at the units here, okay? The units there are going to end up canceling, so then you end up getting one over seconds, which is hertz. So your answer here is going to be 6.00 times 10 to the 15 hertz. Now, 
This brings us to the photoelectric effect. And this is, think about your solar panels in your house. So you've got this energy, you've got the light coming into the panels, and then you have this, this ejection of energy, basically. So energy is equivalent to H, which is another constant. H is your Planck's constant, okay? And energy times frequency. Now, what if you don't know frequency? What if you only know wavelength? Well, you can manipulate that to energy equals Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength, okay? So in the photoelectric effect, what we're looking at is we're looking at photons and photons are these massless bundles of energy, basically. They're light quanta. A quantum of energy is the minimum amount of energy that's required to, for it to be lost or gained by an atom, okay? In order for uh, an electron to move, okay? When light shines on metals, they eject photoelectrons. This is called the photoelectric effect. And if the threshold frequency has been reached, then increasing the intensity only increases the number of electrons ejected. Increasing the frequency is going to increase the speed of the electrons. So we're going to watch a quick video on the photoelectric effect. <laughs> Hello everybody. In this video we're going to talk about the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect is a property of light. Property of light which can best be described by thinking of light as a particle, not a wave. In the last few videos of this playlist we've been talking about all kinds of properties of light, frequency, amplitude, wavelength, interference, diffraction, all these properties that can best be described by thinking of light as a wave. Photoelectric effect is is not the case. So what is the photoelectric effect? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Sometimes when you shine light on the surface of, the, of a metal, so this block here is just a metal, when you shine light on this metal surface, in some cases, the metal can release electrons. So sometimes the light has enough energy to dislodge electrons from the metal. But not all forms of light can do this. If we were to shine blue light on the surface of the metal, regardless of its intensity, even very dim, low-intensity blue light can release electrons from the metal. However, if we were to switch that over to a red lamp, if we were to shine some red light on the surface of this metal, then no electrons would be released. Even if we were to increase the intensity, increase the brightness of that red light, there's no way you're going to get electrons to come off of that metal surface. So this was very puzzling at the time because there were a lot of uh, differences between what classical electromagnetic theory would predict and what was really observed from the photoelectric effect. Classical electromagnetic theory treats light as purely a wave, not a particle. And according to this classical theory, if you change the frequency of the light or the amplitude, which determines the intensity of the light, then this should affect the emission of electrons. So under the classical theory, red light, even at high intensity, should be able to remove electrons from the metal. But in reality, this was not the case. In reality, we have what's called a threshold frequency. And underneath this threshold frequency, regardless of the intensity of the light, electrons would not be dislodged from that metal surface. Another difference between what classical theory would predict and what was really observed is that, according to classical theory, if the light was very dim, then there should be a lag time. There should be a little bit of time that elapses between when the light is shown on the metal and when the electrons are released. But in reality, if you have this low intensity, high frequency light, there was no lag time. The electrons released instantaneously. So how could we account for all of these discrepancies between classical theory and the observed reality? Well, Albert Einstein came along in 1905 and suggested a very wild proposition. He suggested that light energy must come in chunks. So again, now we're treating light as a particle, not a wave. And a particle of light containing a chunk of light energy is what we call a photon. And the amount of energy in a photon of light is given by this equation here, E equals H times nu, where nu, of course, is the frequency of the light, E is the energy of the photon, and H is what we call Planck's constant, which has the value 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. If we wanted to express the energy in terms of the wavelength of the light, we can do that fairly easily. We know from a previous video that nu, the frequency, equals c, the speed of light, over lambda, the wavelength. And so if we substitute that expression for nu into this equation, we're going to get E equals hc over lambda. So again, these two equations are just two different ways of expressing the same thing, 
either expressing the energy in terms of the frequency of the light or in terms of the wavelength of the light. So this proposition elegantly explains the observed reality that we saw in the photoelectric effect. How does it explain the photoelectric effect? Well, again, if we think back, remember that low intensity red light couldn't eject electrons. High intensity red light couldn't eject electrons either. And the reason for this is because if you're increasing the intensity of red light, all you're doing is adding more low energy photons to that metal. Even though you're adding overall more energy to the metal, each photon doesn't have enough energy to dislodge the electron. So none of those photons individually has enough energy to remove an electron from the metal. But if you change the frequency of that light, so if you increase that frequency to say blue light, now you're dealing with photons that have much more energy. Now each of those photons has enough energy individually to remove electrons from that metal. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Uh, in the next couple of videos, we're going to talk even more about how light behaves as a particle. So I hope you stick around for that, and I hope you have a great one. Okay, so hopefully that video was helpful in explaining the photoelectric effect. I think that he does a really good job in talking about that. So going back to this uh, equation that we were looking at, um, when we look at this equation, we know energy equals Planck's constant times frequency. So as frequency goes up, then what happens? The energy goes up. Okay. Now look at where we've changed that. And we're looking at this in terms of energy and wavelength. Notice that wavelength is now on the denominator. So as wavelength goes up, as your denominator goes up, energy goes down. So if we look at that and we look at the photoelectric effect, energy and frequency are directly proportional as frequency goes up, energy goes up energy and wavelength are inversely proportional. So as wavelength goes up, energy goes down. Where is this important? Or how do we even use the photoelectric effect? Well, think about like just your door opener, your garage door opener. All of those, the, the lasers that we're, we're using, that's using the photoelectric effect. So it's using the way that the uh, light is transferring in that situation. So what does this have to do with electrons and how does this even apply? And that basically I'm trying to get you prepared for the lab activity that you're going to do. And so something that's really important is each element has a unique emission spectrum. And it's kind of like a fingerprint for that element. And it's because each element has a certain number of electrons and those electrons are in different energy levels. Because those electrons are in different energy levels, what ends up happening is those electrons can absorb a certain amount of energy. And when they absorb the energy, think about the last time you drank like an energy drink, you absorbed all this energy. And what happened? You like, ah, you let it all out crazy, right? So you emitted your energy, you released the energy. And how do electrons release energy? What do we see? We see that in the form of energy in the form of light. So energy is released by the electrons as they go from the excited state to the ground state, okay? So let me go back over that again. Electrons are at their ground state, their natural state. But when those atoms are hit with energy, what happens is the electrons absorb that energy and they can jump to a different energy level, okay? So they go from the ground state to the excited state. Now they're all excited and they've got all this energy so they release that energy in the form of light. So when an electron goes from the excited state back down to the ground state, it now has released energy in the form of light. So what are we going to do? We're going to take a look at this line emission spectrum. And you're actually going to look at the emission spectrum and you're also going to look at an absorption spectrum. So if an atom has a higher potential energy than its ground state, then it's at its excited state. Okay, and then when those electrons are in the excited state, the electrons crash down to the ground state and release energy in the form of light. Um, so instead of saying atom, that should actually say an electron. When an electron returns to ground state, it's, it lets off energy. A continuous spectrum is produced when all of the colors of a rainbow are formed. So you'll actually see white light and you'll see a con the difference between a continuous spectrum and a line emission spectrum. And then you'll also see the difference between a line emission spectrum and an absorption spectrum in the lab that you're going to do. 
So the line emission spectrum, on the other hand, is going to be specific lines that we see. And those specific lines, like I said earlier, are like a fingerprint for a certain element. So we can look at the line emission spectrum for hydrogen. This one is for helium. And we have neon and sodium and mercury. So we're looking at something that, you know, you can see like mercury is different than sodium and that's different than neon and that's different than helium and hydrogen. So we could look at something and say, okay, I've got this element and this element that I'm watching as I'm, as I'm watching it emit light, it's emitting a certain, a certain spectrum. And this is the spectrum it is emitted. Well, what element is this that I'm burning? Well, if you think about it, look at hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't match perfectly. So it's not hydrogen. It's not helium. Okay. It's not neon. Okay. But what we can see is we can see that with mercury, we have the same lines here, the same lines there. Those lines match up. Those lines. And as you see, you see this pattern. And the pattern is showing me that this element that I'm looking at is actually mercury. 